Uh, greetings and uh, salutations, most honourable podcast listeners. It is your host, Sean, here. How the fuck are you? Just a super quick little thank you up front. The nominations for the Oz Podcast Awards came out today. Unfortunately, we didn't get nominated this year. I'm pretty sure the system's rigged. But I just wanted to say uh, thanks everyone that took the time to vote. It's fucking super considerate of you. You didn't have to take the time to do it, and we really appreciate it. When we went in, like when we got nominated into the awards, we didn't even think we'd get one vote, and it was all just going to be a big joke, but we got lots of votes, people voted. We do the show for you guys, and ourselves anyway, you know, we have fun doing it, we love doing it, we don't do it for awards and to get recognition or whatever, it's just a fun thing to do, and we are still doing it because you guys listen, so thanks for that, we love you, um, go jump on the Patreon if you want, sling us a message, if you want a shout out, or if you want some stickers, or you know, whatever, just say hi. Anyway, it's like 1am now, I need to upload this episode and go to bed. Later, yo. Bye. The soldier was standing guard in the back of an armoured Land Rover on a joint army police patrol in the Republic of New Lodge area of North Belfast. From a high window, the IRA gunman opened fire with automatic weapons. The soldier was hit in the back and neck and died later in hospital. So far, no details of the soldier's name or regiment have been released. He's the second member of the armed forces to be killed in Northern Ireland. from their car, they were challenged by stewards. In panic, they tried to reverse away, but were immediately surrounded by an angry mob. One man smashed a window as the crowd tried to pull the man out of the car. They were shouting, get them out, get them out. Shots were fired and the crowd pulled back. They then dragged the men from the car, beat them up and later shot them. The bodies were found later... Mr. McStephan, what before. was your reaction this week uh, to the news of the death of a second British soldier? Well, the, my reaction as a member of the IRA would be uh, another piece of casualty from forces, a certain amount of satisfaction from the personal level us. Um, we realise that this is a terrible personal tragedy for some family. Uh, this is uh, possibly some young woman uh, being left a widow, possibly children being left without a father. Uh, somebody's son has been killed. But um, uh, and this is the whole tragedy uh, of the situation in Ireland. British troops are not wanted, and. Um, while they are forced to remain here, against the will of many of them, I'm sure, tragedies like this are obviously going to continue. Were these deaths an advantage or a disadvantage to the IRA? The deaths of the British soldiers? I would say that the deaths of British troops in Ireland for the first time in 50 years would be a definite advantage to the IRA. Why's that? Well, it has, without any doubt, it's done more than anything over the past 50 years to bring it home to the British public that unless their troops are withdrawn from Ireland, unless the just demands of the Irish people are met, that these tragedies are going to increase. So that you see a political advantage in British troops being killed? Yes. Today, Belfast street violence began at this bakery. At four o'clock this morning, six snipers opened up on the troops and the resulting gun battle soon brought people onto the streets. One of the snipers was killed by the army. Two more were captured and handed over to the police. Two more men were shot during a gun battle in the White Rock area. There's also been rioting in East Belfast where a soldier was shot in the thigh. And in Anderson's town, the army shot and wounded a petrol bomb thrower. There have now been 21 deaths in three days of violence. <laughs> Yeah.
interrupt our program to bring you this important message. You're listening to Carousel Sniper Victim, a Dead Glass Design production, with your host, Sean Jeffrey. The history of modern Ireland and its interwoven conflicts begins with its conquest by the rulers of England around 300 years ago. The purpose of this English conquest was to seize the wealth of Ireland for the advantage of the English ruling class, and to prevent Ireland from ever developing into an independent nation in its own right. In the early 1600s, there was a great resistance to British rule, particularly from the population of the northeastern province of Ireland, Ulster. The response of the English government was to systematically drive the native Irish from the province. Estates of up to 2,000 acres of land were offered to groups of Englishmen and Scottish known as undertakers. They would pay a nominal rent to the English crown. The undertakers had to promise, though, to clear out the Irish population and take as tenants only English and Scottish settlers. The native Irish were eligible only for the smallest bits of land and had to pay rents twice those paid by the undertakers. This first clearance, if you will, of the Ulster region was not very successful. There was a great uprising against the English and Scottish settlers in 1641. Eight years later, in 1649, the then ruler of England, Oliver Cromwell, crushed the rebellion entirely. His army set out to exterminate as many of the Irish people as possible in the east of the island and to drive the rest into exile. At the siege of Drogheda, Cromwell massacred 30,000 defenders of the city. His slogan became, Death or Connaught, as he attempted to drive the Irish population from the land of the east and into the southwestern provinces of Connaught. All of this upheaval would eventually lead to what the wider world would refer to as the Troubles. The Troubles. The Troubles. The Troubles are described as an ethno-nationalist conflict in Northern Ireland during the late 20th century. They were also known internationally as just the Northern Ireland Conflict. The conflict began in the late 1960s and is usually deemed to have ended with the Good Friday Agreement of 1998. Although the Troubles primarily took place in Northern Ireland, At times, the violence spilled over into parts of the Republic of Ireland, England, and mainland Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a city police mail warning. Please do not interfere with any letters or packets with which you are unfamiliar. Please leave them entirely alone. If in any doubt, contact the police. Thank you. Are you at all worried about the possibility of letter bombs? Well, yes, very. Very anxious, yes. I was just thinking, coming up the stairs, that uh, I've got letters to open and I'll, I'd like to leave it to somebody else because I'm very nervous about it. Do you think this sort of alarm every morning can be kept up? Do you think people can be careful every day from now on? No, no, I don't think so. We can't go on living like this, being frightened of things going off all the time. Oh, I think it's absolutely dreadful because nobody's safe anywhere now. The conflict was primarily political and nationalistic fueled by a number of historical events. A key issue was the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. Unionists, or loyalists, who were mostly Protestants, wanted Northern Ireland to remain within the United Kingdom. Whereas Irish nationalists, or Republicans, who were mostly Catholics, wanted Northern Ireland to leave the United Kingdom and join with a united Ireland. The main participants in the Troubles were Republican paramilitaries such as the Provisional Irish Republican Army, IRA, 
Loyalist paramilitaries such as the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, and Ulster Defence Association, the UDA. British state secretary forces such as the British Army and Royal Ulster Constabulary, and political activists and politicians as well. All of this paramilitary and political chaos would eventually culminate in a twisting tale. A tale that exposed a dizzying conspiracy of espionage, false flag attacks and sectarian violence all of which unravelled in a multi-decade search for justice. It looked and sounded very much like the end of the ceasefire. The army are up here in the middle of Lenardoon Avenue. They'd come to it after an earlier confrontation down the end, which looked at the time like the kind of civil rights clash we knew from years ago. The Miami Show Band was a popular Dublin-based cabaret band, enjoying fame and, according to journalist Peter Taylor, Beatle-like devotion from fans on both sides of the Irish border. A typical Irish show band at the time was based on the popular six- or seven-member dance band. Its basic repertoire included cover versions of pop songs that were currently in the charts and standard dance numbers popular to everyone at the time. The music ranged from rock and country and western to Dixieland jazz. Sometimes the show bands played traditional Irish music as well. The Miami Show Band was formed in 1962, with Dublin-born singer Dickie Rock as their frontman. The Miami Show Band underwent a crazy amount of personnel changes over the years though. In December of 1972, Rock left the band to be briefly replaced by two brothers, Frankie and Johnny Simon. In early 1973, Billy McDonald, aka Billy Mack, took over as the group's frontman when the Simon brothers quit the band. The following year, Fran O'Toole became the band's lead vocalist after Billy Mack's replacement was sacked. O'Toole would be the popular frontman. He was noted for his good looks and popularity with female fans. O'Toole was described by the Miami show band's former bass guitarist, Paul Ashford, as having been, quote, the greatest soul singer in Ireland, end quote. Ashford himself had been asked to leave the band in 1973 for complaining that performing in Northern Ireland was putting their lives at risk. He was replaced by Johnny Brown, who in turn was replaced by Dave Monks, until Stephen Travers eventually became the band's permanent bass player. In 1975, the year Our Story takes place, the lineup of the Miami show band comprised four Catholics and two Protestants. They were lead vocalist and keyboard player Fran O'Toole. He was 28, Catholic. Guitarist Anthony Tony Gerardy, he was 24, Catholic, from Dublin. Trumpeter Brian McCoy, 32, Protestant, from Caledon County, Tyrone. Saxophonist Des McKayley, but most people just called him Des Lee, that's what I'm going to call him. He was 24, a Catholic from Belfast. And bassist Stephen Travers, 24, Catholic, from carrick on sur County Tipperary, and drummer Ray Miller. He was also a Protestant from Antrim. O'Toole, the vocalist, and McCoy, the trumpeter, were both married and each had two children. Their music was described as contemporary and transatlantic, with no reference to the Northern Ireland conflict. By 1975, they had gained a large following playing to crowds of people in dance halls and ballrooms across the island. The band had no overt interest in politics nor in the religious beliefs of any of the people who made up their audience. 
they were prepared to travel anywhere in Ireland to perform for their fans. They just loved playing music. Who cares what the political or religious beliefs of anyone is, they were there for the music and to have fun. And the Miami show band knew how to deliver on fun. So why on earth would anyone want this fun-loving group dead? Look, Ray, uh, you don't have to die to lose your life, you know, and if you loved your life so much, you know, I was very, very carefree, and my wife, uh, Anne, she's like absolutely beautiful, carefree, Pied Piper type person, everybody loved her, and I saw what that did. So sometimes you wake up in the morning, it's like Groundhog Day, and you think, do I have to think about this because people talk about flashbacks and all that. There is, I don't have flashbacks. The thing is always in front of you. It's part of your life. And it's a life that you don't want to lead sometimes. But without the, the you know, my wife and my daughter, uh, I don't think I'd be here. Now, although the conflict in Northern Ireland, known as the Troubles, began in the late 1960s, the year 1975 was especially marked by sectarian attacks and a vicious feud between the two main loyalist paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, and the Ulster Defence Association, the UDA. Both of these paramilitary groups were ardent unionists, loyalists to the British Empire, dedicated to their ideals that Northern Ireland should remain part of England. On Thursday, the 31st of July, 1975, Five members of the Dublin-based band were travelling home after a performance at the Castle Ballroom in Banbridge, County Down. Ray Miller, the band's drummer, was not with them as he had chosen to go to his hometown of Antrim to spend the night with his parents. The band's road manager, Brian Maguire, had already gone ahead a few minutes earlier in the equipment van. At about 2.30 a.m. when the band was seven miles, or 11 kilometers north of Newry, on the main A1 road, their Volkswagen minibus, driven by trumpeter Brian McCoy with Stephen Travers in the front seat beside him, reached the area of Buskill. Near the junction with Buskill Road, they were flagged down by armed men dressed in British Army uniforms waving a red torch in a circular motion. Now, during the Troubles, it was normal for the British Army to set up checkpoints where and whenever they felt like it. McCoy informed the others inside the minibus of a military checkpoint up ahead and pulled in at the lay-by as directed by the armed men. As McCoy rolled down the window, and produced his driving license. Gunmen came up to the minibus and one of them asked in a North Irish accent how the fellas were going. He asked if they could step out of the van and it would just be a few minutes for them to do a check. The band members got out and were politely told to line up facing the ditch at the rear of the minibus with their hands on their heads. More uniformed men appeared from out of the darkness their guns pointed at the minibus. After McCoy had explained to the soldiers that they were the Miami show band, one of the soldiers asked the band members for their names and addresses, while the others bantered with them about the success of their performance that night. As the soldier took down their information, a car pulled up and another uniformed man appeared on the scene. He wore a uniform and beret noticeably different from the other soldiers. He spoke with an educated English accent and immediately took charge. 
ordering a man who appeared to have been the leader of the patrol to tell the soldiers with the notebook to obtain their names and dates of birth instead of addresses. The joking behaviour of the gunmen abruptly ceased. At no time did this new soldier speak to any of the band members, nor did he directly address the soldiers. He relayed all of his instructions to the gunman in command. Travers, the band's bass player, assumed that he was a British Army officer. Now this opinion was shared by McCoy. Just after the arrival of this mysterious soldier, McCoy had nudged Travers who was standing beside him and said, don't worry Stephen, this is the British Army. McCoy was a Protestant from Northern Ireland, familiar with security checkpoints. The British Army would be more efficient than the Ulster Defence Regiment, who had a reputation for being, you know, unprofessional and unpredictable, especially towards people from the Republic. McCoy had close relatives in the security forces around the area. His brother-in-law was a former member of one of the local paramilitary groups. Travers described McCoy as, quote, a sophisticated father-type figure. Everybody was respectful to Brian McCoy. End quote. Therefore, McCoy's words were taken seriously by the other band members, and anything he said was considered to be accurate. This was the local army regiment, conducting a routine check. It wouldn't take long. Whilst the band was standing there, waiting for this inconvenience to come to an end, Des Lee and Stephen Travers heard two of the gunmen rummaging around in the back of the minibus where they kept their respective instruments. Something wasn't right. This wasn't the British Army and it sure as fuck wasn't some routine roadblock. Whilst the people were rummaging around in the back and the Miami show band was still just lined up in front of the ditch, two other gunmen at the front of the minibus were rummaging around near the driver's seat. They were now the only ones inside the minibus when... Suddenly the minibus exploded. The minibus was completely blown apart. The two soldiers in the front, who would later be identified as one Harris Boyle, aged 22, and Wesley Somerville, aged 34, were killed instantly. Thrown out of the minibus in opposite directions, they were both decapitated and their bodies dismembered. What little that remained intact of their bodies was burnt beyond recognition, and one of the limbless torsos was completely charred. All hell broke loose. The five band members had all been blown down into the field below the level of the road from the force of the blast. As they tried to compose themselves, the remaining gunmen, screaming and shouting obscenities, now opened fire on the dazed band members. Brian McCoy was the first to die. Having been hit in the back and neck by nine rounds from a nine millimeter Luger pistol. Despite the heavy gunfire, Tony Garrity, and Fran O'Toole attempted to carry the severely injured Stephen Travers to safety, but they were unable to move him far. Fran O'Toole attempted to run away, but he was quickly chased down by the gunman who had immediately jumped down into the field in pursuit. He was then machine gunned 22 times, mostly in the face as he lay on the ground. Almost his entire head was just destroyed. Tony Garrity also attempted to escape, but he was caught by the gunman and shot twice in the back of the head, a number of times in the back and once in the scrotum. Both men had been pleading for their lives before they were shot. Stephen 
saxophone player Des Lee, who had been standing closest to the minibus, was hit by its door when it was blown off in the explosion, but he was not badly wounded. He lay hidden in thick undergrowth, face down, undetected by the gunman, pretending he was dead. However, the flames from the burning hedge which had been set on fire by the explosion soon came so close that he was forced to leave his hiding spot. But by this time, the gunman had left the scene, assuming that everyone else had been killed. Des Lee made his way up the embankment to the main road, where he quickly made his way back to alert the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the RUC, at their barracks in Europe. When the RUC arrived at the site, they found five dead bodies, body parts, the smouldering remains of the destroyed minibus, debris from the bomb blast, bullets, spent cartridges, and the band members' personal possessions. They also discovered a seriously injured Stephen Travers, who had actually also survived the shooting by playing dead next to the body of McCoy. A stolen white Ford Escort, registration number 4933LZ, which had been left behind by the gunman, was also found, along with two guns, ammunition, a green UDR beret, and a pair of glasses. Within 12 hours of the attack, the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, their brigade staff issued a statement It was released under the heading Ulster Central Intelligence Agency Miami Showband Incident Report and it reads as follows. A UVF patrol led by Major Boyle was suspicious of two vehicles, a minibus and a car parked near the border. Major Boyle ordered his patrol to apprehend the occupants for questioning. As they were being questioned, Major Boyle and Lieutenant Somerville began to search the minibus. As they began to enter the vehicle, a bomb was detonated and both men were killed outright. At the precise moment of the explosion, the patrol came under intense automatic fire from the occupants of the other vehicle. The patrol sergeant immediately ordered the fire to be returned. Using self-loading rifles and submachine guns, the patrol returned fire killing three of their attackers and wounding another. The patrol later recovered two Armalite rifles and a pistol. The UVF maintains regular border patrols due to the continued activity of the provisional IRA. It would appear that the UVF patrol surprised members of a terrorist organisation transferring weapons to the Miami Shoban minibus, and that an explosive device of some description was being carried by the Shoban for an unlawful purpose. It is obvious, therefore, that the UVF patrol was justified in taking the action it did, and that the killing of the three Shoban members should be regarded as justifiable homicide. The UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, was pinning the whole thing on the Miami showband, claiming that they were smuggling bombs for the IRA. So, what really happened? The answers to that question would be a search for the truth that took the remaining two band members decades to uncover. It's now been proven that at least four of the gunmen were soldiers from the UDR, the Ulster Defence Regiment, the locally recruited infantry regiment of the British Army in Northern Ireland. Martin Dillon suggested in his book The Dirty War that at least five serving UDR soldiers were present at the checkpoint. What we do know is that all of the gunmen, however, were members of the Loyalist UVF Mid-Ulster Brigade, 
they had been lying in wait to ambush the band, having set up the fake checkpoint just minutes before. Once the minibus had been pulled over, and the band members had filed out, two of the gunmen placed a 10-pound, four and a half kilo time bomb that was inside of a briefcase under the driver's seat. The UVF's plan was that the bomb would explode once the minibus had reached Newry, killing all of the members on board. They had hoped to embarrass the government of Ireland, as well as to draw attention to its level of control of the border. This may have resulted in the Irish authorities enforcing tighter controls over the border, therefore restricting the IRA's operations, which was a good thing for the British government. The members of the Miami show band were just puppets having their strings pulled to walk them blindly into an organised hit, orchestrated by a bunch of shady paramilitary groups, and possibly government officials. So what went wrong? As the two soldiers were sliding the briefcase under the driver's seat, they tilted it on its side. Now this shouldn't have been a problem. However, when the device was tilted on its side, clumsy soldering on the clock used as a timer caused the bomb to explode prematurely. So what was meant to be a covert false flag operation ended up as a bungled massacre by gunfire with survivors. Two active UDR soldiers and one former UDR soldier were found guilty of the murders and received life sentences. However, they were released in 1998. Those responsible for the attack belonged to the Glen Ann Gang, a secret alliance of loyalist militants, rogue police officers and UDR soldiers. There are also allegations that British military intelligence agents were involved. According to former intelligence agents Captain Fred Holroyd, the killings were organised by British intelligence officer Robert Nyrak, together with the UVF's Mid-Ulster Brigade and its commander, Robin the Jackal Jackson. An investigative panel established by the Irish government known as the Historical Inquiries Team investigated the killings and released their report to the victims' families in December of 2011. It confirmed that the Jackal, Jackson, was linked to the attack by fingerprints, but nothing linking any government officials to the crime could be found. That answer didn't sit very well with Stephen Travers. He says the Irish government should be, quote, getting answers from the British government about allegations emerging from some recently released state papers. Declassified documents from 1987, published in 2017 under the 30-year release rule, revealed a letter stating British intelligence agency MI5 had supplied the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF, with detonators, quote, which they had set to explode prematurely, end quote. As happened during the attack on the Miami show bed, Mr. Travers wrote on Twitter, quote, I woke this morning to the news that, for the past 30 years, the Irish government was in possession of a letter from the UVF admitting that they were given the bomb by the British that murdered the Miami show band and left me dying in a blood-soaked field. We could have maybe closed the book on this and said at least we have got to the bottom of it. To hear the Irish government had information and had confirmation of this, what we always said, that MI5 had given these detonators to the UVF. I mean, the way they put it in the letter was almost as if the big problem was that MI5 was giving faulty detonators to kill them off, and we were almost collateral damage, but maybe that's just the way they looked at it. End quote. 
For 30 years, the Irish government had been in possession of a letter from the UVF admitting they carried out the Miami Choban massacre with detonators provided by British intelligence agency MI5. The English were running covert missions inside Ireland, openly killing innocent people so they could be framed for political gain. Stephen Travers is still determined to get to the truth. He is convinced that the band members were pawns in a grand scheme to have the border hardened. Quote, We were targeted because the British wanted our government to seal the borders so that the IRA wouldn't be able to cross easily into the relative safety of the South after committing some sort of atrocity. So they thought, let's frame the most trusted, most innocent commuters. People who travel up and down all the time. And they thought of us. We would have gone down in history as terrorists carrying bombs for the IRA. And they probably would have planted guns in the van too. When a government decides to murder its own citizens, and to murder the citizens of its closest neighbour, there's no way you can excuse that. End quote. When a government looks at its own people as collateral damage in their war for political control, that's a dangerous place to be. In Alan Moore's V for Vendetta, the protagonist speaks this phrase, People shouldn't be afraid of their government. Governments should be afraid of their people. The main point of the saying was based on Thomas Jefferson's quote of, If people have fear of the government, there's tyranny. If the government has fear of the people, there's liberty. When pushed too far, people will rise up and create either a revolution or a civil war. There's a huge plethora of historical examples. The English Civil War, American Revolution, American Civil War, French Revolution, Spanish Civil War, the Arab Spring, the list goes on and on. The people who engaged in these revolutions and civil wars felt they were living in unacceptable ways, so, you know, so unacceptable that it was worth the efforts and dangers of going to war. And that is the mindset that gave birth to so many of these paramilitary groups back in the Troubles of Northern Ireland. When governments admit to not only killing their own civilians, but hiding the information, even when it's brought forward years later, you have to ask yourself, whose interests were they really representing? Soldiers, go on home. 